Father in heaven, your followers have no reason for fear. We have no reason for fear because of what your son did, that he rescued, that he redeemed, that he purchased with his own blood people unto you. Father, I pray for your grace as we seek to remember your son now. Would you allow us by your grace to remember him well, to remember him for who he is. I pray it in Christ's name, amen. All right. This is the point in our service where we take time to remember Christ. It is a time for Christians to remember what Christ has done for them in his work accomplished on the cross on their behalf. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at a passage which shows us that Jesus demonstrates himself to be the Son of God. We're going to look at why that is so important for believers. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 8? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 together. The setting here in Matthew 8 is Jesus has just finished teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus provides radical new teaching that was new to his listeners. It was radical because they came to have a clear understanding of exactly who it was who would inherit eternal life. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those that are poor in spirit, those are the ones who will have the kingdom of heaven. He says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Gentle will inherit the earth. But Jesus also condemns the broken religious system of his day. In verse 20 of chapter 5, Jesus says, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. By the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew records for us that this crowd is amazed. They are amazed because Jesus is teaching as one who has authority. And they're wondering, who is this man and where did he get this authority? Where does he get the authority to say these things? Matthew takes the, new chapter, the next two chapters, chapter 8 and chapter 9. He lists a series of nine miracles in which Jesus provides the answer to that. Each miracle proves to us, and what Jesus demonstrates to us, is that he is the Son of God. So we're going to look at the first of those in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 8. Matthew starts his story in this miracle by saying that large crowds are following Jesus. These crowds are most likely consist of most of the people who were with him as he taught the Sermon on the Mount, and they've come off the mountain with him. So large people are around Jesus. A large crowd is with him. People are all around him, and we notice that a leper comes to him. God gave Israel very clear instruction on how it was that they were to deal with leprosy. And the bottom line in all of that instruction was that the leper was to live separate from the general public in Israel. When they were in the wilderness prior to their entry into the promised land, the leper was to remain outside of the camp. And once they entered into the promised land, the leper was to remain outside of the towns and the cities and the villages. So they were to be separate from the people. But this leper comes to Jesus. He comes right up to him personally. And verse 2, at the end of that verse, explains what this man understands about Jesus that would compel him to do that. The first thing that he understands about Jesus is his position. He says to Jesus, he addresses Jesus, Lord. He addresses Jesus as master. And what he tells us at the end of this verse helps us understand that he knows exactly who Jesus is. This is just not some simple customary greeting. He understands that Jesus has the one who has ultimate power. He declares that Jesus has ultimate power at the end of the verse by saying, you can make me clean. He does not say to Jesus, would you make me clean? He says, you can make me clean. He's communicating something. What he's saying here is, because you are Lord, because you have the position of Lord, I believe you have the power to make me clean. I know you can. But not only does he understand Jesus' position as Lord and understand that Jesus has power, he also understands that Jesus has prerogative. And we see that at the beginning of the way he addresses Jesus. He says, if you are willing. He knew that any healing that he would experience would come about only because of Jesus' choice to exercise the authority that he has. So this man understands Jesus' position. He understands Jesus' power. 
He understands Jesus' prerogative, and then Jesus speaks in verse 3. And Jesus does two things for us in verse 3. He declares his deity, and then he demonstrates his deity. And he declares his deity simply by saying, I am willing. Jesus is saying, I have what does not belong to any other man, and because I have that ability, I will use that, and I am willing to use that ability. I will exercise my power however I see fit. And then Jesus actually demonstrates that deity that he declares that he has. He looks at the man and he says, be cleansed. What we see there is that Jesus doesn't employ any particular strategy or theatrics. Jesus does what only the Son of God can do and he commands that that man be cleansed. And that is exactly what happens. Matthew tells us immediately his leprosy was clean. We want to notice one other thing that Jesus does here that helps us understand more about who Jesus is. Notice that Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him. Jesus didn't merely command that he would be healed and the man was healed. He stretched out and touched him and the man was healed. And that tells us something about Jesus because normally when a person stretches out and touches a leper, that person becomes a leper. But here we see what happens. Jesus stretches out and he touches the man and the man becomes clean. So what does that tell us this morning as we gather around the Lord's table? Really is that there is only one conclusion we can make about Jesus. We look at his position that he has as Lord. We look at the power that he has. We look at his prerogative to exercise that power. We see that he is not polluted by the effects of this world. The only conclusion that we can come to is that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And the way that's relevant to us this morning as we remember Christ around his table is Jesus' relation to sin, and that is that he has power over sin. In two particular ways, Jesus can do two things for us. One, Jesus has the capacity to take upon himself the sin of all of those who would look to him as the Savior, as the Lord, as the Son of God. He has the capacity to become liable and answerable and responsible for the sin of all of those who would look to him as their Savior and their Lord. But he doesn't just have that capacity to take that sin upon himself. He has the capacity to actually satisfy God's wrath that is the right and the good and the just response to that sin. And Jesus did that on a cross outside of Jerusalem very nearly 2,000 years ago. We're here to remember that this morning. That's how we want to remember Jesus today. So if you are a follower of Jesus and you understand Jesus the way that this man sees Jesus, as the one who has ultimate power, the one who has the position of Lord, then I encourage you to take a minute as the elements come to you and ponder what the identity of Christ means for you, that when Jesus went to a cross, he actually had the capacity to take your sin within himself and bear that sin and then bear God's judgment against that sin and completely satisfy God's judgment against that sin. And then when your heart is prepared, take the elements when you are ready. I want to look at one other thing, and that's at the beginning of verse 2. It's the very first thing that the leper does before he does anything else in his interaction with Jesus. Notice what Matthew tells us. Matthew tells us that he bows down. Mark and Luke also record this same interaction with Jesus. Mark tells us that the man was falling down on his knees. And Luke tells us that the man fell on his face. Clearly a prostrate position, clearly a position of worship, clearly a position of submission. This man understood who Jesus was and he understood that Jesus was worthy of his worship and he was eager to give that worship right in the presence of many other people who did not understand fully who he was. The Lord's table is for Christians. It's for people whose lives are marked by not only an acknowledgement of who Jesus is, but a worship of Christ. They love him. They revere him. They adore him. They understand what he did on their behalf at the cross. And because of that, they have devoted their life to following him. If that is not you, we want you to understand that we're very, very thankful that you're here with us this morning on this Mother's Day. We're very thankful that you've come to worship with us. But please understand that uh, the Lord's table is for Christians. So as the elements come to you, simply decline them and let them pass to the next person next to you. But understand that this is a good opportunity for you to take this time to redeem this time and consider the claims that Christ has made here. Conclude, consider the things that he demonstrates about how he is indeed worthy of your worship, how he is indeed worthy of your obedience. 
He is worthy of you considering him to be his Lord and his master. And he can indeed save you from your sin. Uh, I will be available after the service up at the table in the front. The other elders will be available. Or you could just talk to the person in the row next to you about what it looks like to live in a right relationship to the one who does have the right to worship over you. So men, come and serve us. And when we're all done, I'll close our time in prayer.